All right, so I'll go ahead and get us started and folks can join us um, at their leisure. Um, good morning for, for those joining us in the United States and good afternoon for those joining us um, in the UK. Uh, my name is Ashton Ellett. I am the politics and public policy archivist here at the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our conversation with Dr. Mark Pack. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, thank our event co-sponsors, the Applied Politics Certificate Program at the University of Georgia, the Public Affairs Communications Program at Grady College, and the University of Georgia Press. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Dr. Kaylin Stukesbury, for helping coordinate the Zoom and running things on the back end. And thanks also to um, the Richard B. Russell Foundation um, for their financial support of the library um, so we can put on programs like this one. I'd also like to introduce my co-host and moderator, Professor Joe Watson. He is the Carolyn Caudell Teeger Professor of Public Affairs Communications at UGA's Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communications. He's also the director of its Public Affairs Communications program there. Prior coming to UGA, Joe led the Public Affairs Communications Group for the Exelon Corporation and served as an Associate Administrator in the U.S. Department of Commerce during the George W. Bush administration. A former Capitol Hill staffer, Joe was Legislative Counsel and Legislative Director for former United States Senator Peter Fitzgerald of Illinois. And of course, our guest today is Dr. Mark Peck. Elected in 2020, Mark is currently the President of the Liberal Democrats of the United Kingdom. He received his undergraduate degrees in history and economics, as well as his doctorate in history from the University of York. He worked for the Liberal Democrats from 2000 to 2009. As part of that work, he oversaw the Liberal Democrats online campaigns during the 2001 and 2005 general elections. From 2009 to 2019, Mark worked as a communications consultant for MHP Communications and Blue Rubicon a former lecturer at City University in London and editor of the Journal of Liberal History. He is the author of three books, 101 Ways to Win an Election, written with Edward Maxfield, Bad News, What the Headlines Don't Tell Us, and the main subject of today's webinar, Polling Unpacked, The History, Uses, and Abuses of Political Opinion Polling, which was, this was published this year from Reaction Books in the UK and the University of Chicago Press here in the United States. You can read him regularly in the Liberal Democrat Newswire and listen to him on the podcast, Never Mind the Bar Charts. Mark, thank you so much for taking uh, time this afternoon uh, to talk politics, polling, the politics of polling. Um, for, for the benefit of our American audience and perhaps some in the United Kingdom, you're the president of the Liberal Democrats. What does that mean and what does that entail? I guess in US political language, it's the equivalent roughly of being chair of the DNC or the RNC, uh, except that my role in the Liberal Democrats is elected by all party members. So we have a election once every three years in which people get to vote directly to who's the president. If you're less familiar with party politics, I guess it's the equivalent of being chair of a board of trustees or maybe uh, the head of a university department. I, I won't get too much into commenting how university and party politics compare, but uh, there are maybe some parallels there. <laughs> one or one or two. How how does how does that differ from party leader? So party our party leader at the moment, Ed Davey. He's a member of the House of Commons as an elected MP by the public. And uh, on the, when that glorious day arrives that the Liberal Democrats win a general election in the UK, he would be prime minister. So that's. The party leader is the sort of the, the public front person, whilst as president, that's much more of a backroom, uh, a backroom role. And hence, I think, you know, the analogy with, say, chair of the DNC or the RNC right. in the US. So I think um, what's first and foremost in my mind, as well as, as, as Joe's, what's the state of UK politics right now, Mark? Uh, chaotic, perhaps, is the best way of describing it. I mean, it's I, what, there are so many variations on the chaos and unprecedented that one one can say. But I think what is interesting, and again, perhaps particularly for you know listeners from the US, is I think one of the big differences between the British and the US political system is how speedily power can change. And that I think right. you know that a lot of the underlying strains actually in the political systems in both countries have some similarities. But whilst in, U in the US, there's much more of this issue about, you know, is there a logjam? Is there 
you know, sort of entrenched division in, in, in the UK. It's much more about at the moment of drama, somebody gets bundled out of office really quickly. So we're at, at the moment in a helter skelter four day period between uh, the prime minister having announced she's going and possibly knowing by the end of Monday evening who the new prime minister will be. If the Conservatives don't coalesce around one person, they'll then have a ballot that will be concluded by Friday next week. So we're right in the midst of picking our next prime minister. And the I saw where um, Sir Keir Starmer has, has mm. called for a general election. Is that also the position of the Liberal Democrats? Yeah, because it is so chaotic, but also, you know, the new prime minister will then be replaced uh, a prime minister who in turn replaced a prime minister who was the one that was on the back, you know, in the election uh, back in 2019, but also fundamentally just the state of the country and the, what we need from our government and the decisions and dilemmas facing the government are very different now, actually, from the 2019 election. And so that the argument that, look, give the voters a choice, I think is a really good one. I also think there's an advantage in the public scrutiny that you get, that one of the things that has got went wrong for Liz Truss's, Liz Truss's government in its very brief lifespan was announcing plans that then fell apart really quickly uh, when confronted with, with the outside world. And actually, if those had been plans promoted during a general election campaign, they would have fallen apart during the election campaign. They wouldn't have you know, they wouldn't have won the election and the country as a whole would be better off. So I, I, I'm i always a great believer in the, the value of giving policy ideas a really good kicking during an election, because that, you know, the people we elect are not perfect by any means, but but that does tend to result in better government. As Sure. Well, Joe, I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Uh, otherwise, I'll just sit here and ask questions all day. And I, I, I don't want to leave you out, my friend. No, no, I, I, I think it's interesting. You know, I, I was kind of thinking when we, we were having this discussion about polling and everything and about the fluidity of British elections and British leadership changes. And, you know, I, I, I instruct a number of courses in my public affairs communications program. And, you know, I was reminding my student that some of the most notable, you know, prime ministers of our, of our lifetime lost election, not because they lost a general election, but because they lost in terms of an internal leadership leadership uh, struggle. I was wondering if I could tie in a question to, mm. to the book on, on the polling and ask if, um, because of the nature of British elections uh, in terms of, of, you know, a lack of vote of no confidence mm. and a government falling and then perhaps having an election call, how does that affect polling in the UK versus the US and and I was that was probably the first yeah. question that came to me yeah. when I when I when I perused the book and knew that I was going to speak to you because you know in the United States we know when our elections are coming all the time and so we have an expectation of when it's going to come Americans traditionally you know we have a lot of polling in the field right now um in part because we know we're having elections in November and people know that going out um, you know, years ahead of time. How does how does the 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 greater volatility in in British elections contribute to differences in in polling practices and efficacy? Um, I think well, it makes political polling actually more important and more powerful. I okay. think in the UK than in the US, because in the US, if you have a president who consistently faces really bad polling numbers, they're still going to be president until the the end of their term of office. Right. You no. Know? I guess one could maybe argue that during the Watergate scandal that polling had a little bit of an impact on you know, Nixon's decision to resign, or at least indirectly on, you know, the willingness of Republicans to say, OK, we would, you know, we would in, uh, impeach the president. But fundamentally, however bad your polling is, you'll still get to the end of your term of office. And that's so not the case in the UK. As you rightly say, it's quite a novelty now. For a prime minister to lose office because they've lost a general election they normally get and and the great thing about political polling in that respect is what it does is it gives a really powerful voice to the public because particularly our newspapers have quite strong partisan leans in their editorial lines um but you know even the most for example think about recent events even the most right wing of newspapers when you're faced with polling repeatedly showing the prime minister is very unpopular in the end, even their editorial coverage bends to reflect that reality. And so I think political polling, and hence the onus on pollsters to get it right, is is probably more important in British politics than it is in US politics. 
Yeah, and just to follow up on that, so you know, we've become acclimated, you know, from 2016 to present, um, both with President Trump and now with President Biden of having uh, American presidents who are polling well under 50, um, mm. you know, re really generally polling in, in the, the mid to low 40s. And that's kind of become almost a new normal mm. in our polarized era. I'm wondering what, you know, and so when I grew up in politics, you know, the benchmark is you you wanted your your favorability numbers to be north of 50. And that was kind of considered good health. What is it for a British prime minister? And if you could give us any insights into um Prime Minister Truss's numbers and how they deteriorated, you know, um, I'm just curious what's kind of considered a, a viable uh, favorability in the UK versus the US. Yeah, I mean, Truss's numbers ended up just so jaw-droppingly bad that in future years, people will probably wonder, was that a data entry error or a slip on the ground? <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, one, of, one of the last approval rating uh, figures was a minus 60%, so net minus 60, just wow. absolutely, you know, um, the joke is that only Prince Andrew... So, so like underwater 60, under, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's that's, that's, that's not crazy. just underwater, that's that's just about at the ocean floor, you know, you've, oh you've really yeah. hit that. So, but I think, um, I, th I think in Britain, what is a little bit different is that the normal sort of net approval numbers that we look at, almost always it's leader of the government and leader of the opposition and you've got those numbers as a pair and people yeah. use those numbers as a pair um, and therefore it's been quite common for leaders to have quite low net approval but still seem to be doing quite well because their net approval is a lot better than someone else so Keir Starmer at the moment is considered to be polling very well and his party is way ahead in the voting intention figures his net approval numbers, depending on what the wording is and which pollster it is, tend to be positive, but only low single digits. Mm -hmm. But when you compare that to minus 60, that's yes. massively better. So I, I don't think that the, the um, politicians sort of poll particularly better in the UK, but because of that comparison, mm -hmm. often the one who is you know doing least worst is seen as being much more popular. And well, that Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to follow up on that about, about Keir Starmer's numbers, which are not he's not necessarily seen as an exceedingly strong leader mm. or, or an ex he's not viewed very positively. But compared to, say, his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn, exactly. who, who's whose net negativity numbers. And, and obviously, this is still a huge issue within the Labour Party itself mm. with the Labour left and the the, the the soft left or the center of the party so so is, is that what what's more important to be favorable or to not have incredibly bad negativity numbers well I, I think it's a bit similar in some ways actually to the um Clinton Trump you know US presidential election that if you took Trump's approval numbers and so on at the time they were pretty poor Mm -hmm. But he had the advantage of being up against somebody who had also exceptionally poor numbers. And in Britain, although Boris Johnson, because he won the 2019 election, he has this aura, at least in some circles, of being an election winner and a successful, you know, successful party leader as a result. Actually, his figures in 2019 were pretty bad, but he was up against Corbyn and Corbyn's figures were even worse. And, and I think, you know, had had he been up against Starmer, you know, it would have almost certainly been a very different picture. And in reverse, I think that's what's benefiting Starmer now is Starmer's ratings have definitely improved. But what has really happened is the Tory ratings have fallen, fallen through the floor and that therefore makes him look really good by comparison. And of course, in fairness, you know, you only need to beat who you're up against. You know, that's that's all that matters in the end. Sure. So I, I thinking about that and looking at we were talking before before we went live a bit about the, the these most recent polls that mm. you scroll through Twitter, you, you look at UK election maps or, or you know, polling UK and, and and look at these sort of different aggregations. And I, I'm wondering because you see a huge, huge rise mm. in the number of uh, the voting intention for labor, uh, basically in line with the collapse of the conservative vote. Why have we not seen necessarily a an uptick in support for liberal Democrats, which 
historically, a lot of folks, especially in, in the, the, the leafy suburbs and the home counties, liberal Democrats are the, the strongest opponents uh, of conservative voters. Is that just something that's not seen at the national level polling, but would come across in the constituencies themselves in a general election? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a really interesting sort of variation in the picture, depending on what what bit of polling you look at at the moment. So definitely in the national headline voting intentions, you know, Lib Dem figures have been fairly flat. And I think that reflects that you get a really strong sort of two party squeeze, a really strong, you know, media focus on the two main parties at moments of crisis like this. But then if you look at um, YouGov, one of the pollsters here, for example, ask people to rate their willingness to vote for a party on a scale from zero, never to 10 definite, so 11 point scale, zero to 11. If you look at people who give, I think the figures are seven to 10, at the sort of top end of the scale, more people pick the Lib Dems than Conservatives on that measure. So beneath those headline figures, there definitely is a big willingness of a lot of people to think about voting Lib Dem. And you see this, therefore, in the seat projections that essentially the more the seat projections model in those sorts of local tactical considerations the bigger the number of Lib Dem seats um, that that they come out of those projection calculations so I, I think what those YouGov figures you know illustrate is the degree of softness there is that there's a very strong public mood of they really don't want the current conservative shambles to be in in government but it's quite an open question as to whether that will translate into some people, maybe under a new Tory leader, people swinging back to the Tories, maybe Keir Starmer actually turning the sort of, you know, moderately good, but relatively impressive, but only moderately, you know, good figures into really positive ones. Or indeed, the hope for my party is that we can turn that into more people voting Lib Dem. So politics is a very, very open field at the moment. It's both scary and exciting as a result. So if I could just jump in, I want to ask another 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 polling question. And I want to want to say that, you know, one of the things that really kind of shook American politics in 2016 with President Trump's election was the real surprise in a lot of constituencies because of um, polling numbers that writ large anticipated a very different outcome and that overall consistently showed. Hillary Clinton ahead, including including key state polls. It wasn't just the national horse race polls; it was those polls. And coming out of that, pollsters in the U.S. have kind of you know struggled and tried to do it. Part of it, I think, has always been, and I try to reinforce this with students, is that in America there's kind of a misperception as to what polls are. I mean, polls are kind of snapshots, and they're different samples. There are all these different pieces going on, um, but this really brought all those challenges to the fore in terms of 2016. I'm wondering if in the UK there's been anything similar in terms of kind of a, of a, of a crisis in polling that has kind of put increased pressure on pollsters to um, shore up their models and, and do things. Because in the United States, it's had a really pretty significant impact on, on uh, a lot of leading, leading pollsters. Yeah, definitely. There have been some similar moments of crisis for pollsters in the UK, most recently, probably the 2015 general election result. But interestingly, you know, if you look at those 2016 US presidential election polls, if you look at, say, the Real Clear Politics average, yes, just before exactly. polling day, yes. the Real Clear Politics average had Clinton 47, Trump 44. The actual result was 48 to 46. So Clinton out by one point, Trump out by two points. The average had a, her ahead by three. In reality, she was ahead by two. So the national polls overall were pretty good. And I think there's an important lesson there, which is that often when the polls are seen to have gone wrong, it's a more subtle thing than mm -hmm. simply the top headline voting figures were wrong. And I think, you know, looking at it from out the outside, I think one of the things that went wrong in 2016 was people assumed that if you're ahead in the national vote share, you will end up being president. And of course, exactly. yes, there's the Electoral College and all of that. But prior to 2016, it had been, what, 120 years or so, with the, with only one exception in 2000, which I'll come to in a moment. But, you know, since the last time someone had won the popular vote share but lost the Electoral College. And 2000 had been the exception, but that was such a weird election for all sorts of reasons. So I think part of the reason 
people felt the polls got it wrong was it just almost like a complacency about well if you're ahead in the polls surely you're going to win the electoral college and then of course there were absolutely some individual state polling which was way way off and that yeah. then added to the picture and it's similar in the UK that you know we've had some elections where the polls have been quite inaccurate and nobody's really noticed because they said somebody would win by a landslide and they actually won by a bit bit of a smaller landslide well who nobody gets too fast in those cases but 2015 was a really bad year for British pollsters because not only were the figures quite a long way off but the result was really different from what everyone had been expecting to be in you know a, a possibility so the election campaign was all about might there be another hung parliament might there be another coalition might there be a small Labour majority and as it turned out the Tories won the election comfortably so you look back at the election and think oh that coverage was all a bit a bit about a mirage um but, the, but and I think one of the common things again between say 2015 in the UK and 2016 in the US is that the fundamental problem with the polling was the samples were not representative enough yes and that is just that's the you know that's the pollster's nightmare because because if, the, if your sample isn't representative in a way that you can't measure it's only when the election result turns out differently that you discover that. And so that's always the nightmare fear uh, for any any good pollster as they may be hit by that problem again. You mentioned re uh, real clear politics, mm. which was in, to my mind, the first you know, sort of polling aggregating mm. site that I remember. Um, but, you know, thinking back to my undergraduate days, but since that time, you've seen the rise of like 538.com, um, which is probably the most high profile of, of those sites, but also aggregating um, algorithms analysis. On the whole, do you think the rise of sort of the, those aggregating sites or, or, or polling analysis has been a net positive, a net negative for for sort of political coverage, or or has it? How has it changed the way? Here's a better way of asking: How has it changed how people view and understand yeah. political polling? Yeah, I think so. I think there's one important difference, but in the, that sort of averaging between in between the US and the UK and how that's done. So in the UK, we have various polling averaging averages, and I think straightforwardly that's quite a helpful thing to happen because it helps guard you against getting too excited about any one individual poll. So, for example, there was People Polling, who were one of the newer and slightly more controversial pollsters in the UK. They had had a poll out yesterday, uh, which showed my party, the Lib Dems, only three points behind the ruling party, the Conservatives, in the polls. But rather wisely, I think, both uh, li my Lib Dem colleagues are not getting too overexcited about this, because you look at the polling averages and you see that is... Now, that poll is a bit of an outlier and so having the averages there to help guard you against getting too excited about small movements and outliers is really helpful what i think is the crucial though methodological difference um in the us is things like the 538 model use historic data to try and predict what is likely to shift and so for example if around uh the party convention the nominating convention if you see a bump of three points for the party that's just had its convention the 538 model says well actually is that bigger or smaller than the amount of bump you usually get and so because us politics has a more at least at the presidential election level has a more regular rhythm of events leading up to polling day you can try and predict well is this relatively good or bad compared to the past in a way that you can't in in the uk so in the uk it's much more about simply averaging rather than that more yeah. predictive version in the us and I think, you know, I, I, I think the more you have them, you have models and averages and therefore, in a sense, different people arguing over whether their model is better than someone else's, the better in a way, because that sheds more light on what the numbers really mean. If you I mean, I, I love listening every now and again to the 538 podcast and every now and again, they throw a bit of shade at, uh, at, at, at other other models and averages. But actually in doing so that helps I think all of us understand better what's happening so I think I think overall they're a net positive but they are all dependent on the quality of the underlying polls and so just because you've got a really clever model that doesn't mean you've removed all doubt about what's going to happen yeah and I just want to follow up I mean I, I also think that the that the kind of the public perception of polling as a means of gauging a horse race between mm -hmm 
two parties or two candidates or, or whatever, it, it seems to kind of, I, I think, undervalue what polls actually are. I mean, polls actually do a very good job of telling you um, about priorities and policy interests and, and, and a lot of other things. They do that pretty good and they're pretty darn consistent and excellent gauges of those things. But the horse race piece of it is, in my mind, sometimes the thing that polls are the least effective at, at getting exactly accurate because it is so difficult to do that, um, that it, it, seems, it seems that there's still just a general um, public lack of understanding of the different utility. And I think, you know, having worked for an organization that used public opinion research really, you know, regularly to help navigate issues and navigate corporate priorities and things like that, I never had an issue where I came out and said, wow, they blew it or anything like that. I always found I got information that was useful that helped us to achieve our objectives. But but I, I just think that there's the, the awareness. I'm wondering if you share that that sentiment in terms of the, the misperception of the utility of the instruments, because overall, they're really incredibly net positive. But if you're really looking at one thing that they don't necessarily do a great job of, I wonder if you don't kind of miss the miss the mark on, on what their what their benefit is. Yeah, and particularly because of the once you move away from the headline voting intention figures. Yes, exactly. The the degree of resolution that you need, the degree of precision that you need for the figures to be meaningful reduces significantly. So I gave that example of Liz Truss having a 9% approval rating in a recent poll here in the UK. Even if that poll is way out and actually her true approval rating is, say, 19% approve, that's still disastrous. Right. However, putting her party on 30% when it's actually on 40%, that's the difference between being, you know, on, on course for a landslide defeat and touch and go as to whether or not you're going to win. And so, you know, because particularly where you've got a two party or a two candidate contest, mm -hmm. a very small difference in the number of votes in the vote share, you know, a very small error can really change the picture that you draw. But if you're asking overall, how worried are people about a particular topic, right. being five or 10 points out still probably doesn't change the overall picture that you would you would draw from it. So I think absolutely one of the problems with the horse race fixation is that you you're, you're trying to get it's this horrible paradox of the heart of polling. We're more interested. We we get most interested in the horse race numbers. The closer the result is going to be, looks like <laughs> it's going to be, and that's the very occasion where you actually should be stepping back and saying, you know what, can't have. There's not a degree of precision here that's good enough to be able to tell us. But right. we so we get most interested at the very point at which is most likely to fail to tell us what's going to happen. But also the other advantage of stepping away from the voting intention numbers is is it tells you more about the why things are happening the way they're happening. So, you know, in the US, for example, at the moment, being able to delve away into the numbers that tell you, for example, how concerned are people about the uh, relatively recent Supreme Court ruling on abortion? That is really important to understand what's driving voter choice. Exactly. And if you only look at the headline numbers, you might think, well, is it about abortion? Is it about inflation? Is it about, you know, getting into you know, things like the mo what are the most important issues to people, that just adds so much colour and detail and understanding. Thank you for that clarification. That was, was very well st stated. Thank you. Well, and I think that that's a nice segue into you know, the book itself. Mm. It, it, is what was, the, what was your initial motivation for writing this book? Um, because I'm sure it's not, not because you had lots of time to kill, um, <laughs> you know, during between your day job. <laughs> But well, it's partly because although there's a lot of really good sort of news and current affairs coverage of polling, also mm -hmm. quite a lot of not very good, but there's quite a lot of very good. And, you know, if you, if you, you know, read the 538 website or listen to their mm -hmm. podcast, for example, or look at the coverage, say, in The Economist, uh, you know, on, right. on, on polling or the New York Times and the Upshot, there's lots of good coverage. But by its very nature, that's all very newsy and that leaves quite a lot of big gaps. Um, in the story of how polling developed, what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are. So I, it felt to me like there might be an interesting gap. And then when I started digging into it, the thing that really struck me is if you look at popular histories of polling, if you look at you know previous books that have been written and so on, they give George Gallup a really generous write-up. And actually there's quite a lot more to the story of Gallup and his 
you know, pioneering polling in the early 20th century than, than you usually, you know, you usually get in accounts. So I would George Gall, yeah, I would, I would, go ahead, Ashton. Oh, no, I was just going to say George Gall. I, I think this may, this, this may be less true now than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, where Gallup was the, the, the sort of gold standard. And, and now it, it, you know, in the United States, and now the sort of definition of gold standard has changed somewhat, but gold standard polling operations now tend to be large news organizations or large news organizations part, uh, partnering with small liberal arts colleges in the Northeast for some odd reason, Marist College, Quinnipiac, Monmouth, Suffolk. Um, tell us about George Gallup and, and, and for those less familiar with him, what was so so uh, pathbreaking or transformational, and, and what's your take, um, in particular, from the book on on Gallup and his contributions to to political polling? So the traditional story, the of George Gallup is that he came along in the 1930s with essentially the the first round of modern scientific polling and prior to that people had done various sort of surveys and so on but they'd not really understood the science of meth and methodology of sampling and getting a representative sample so prior to the 1936 u.s presidential election the the apparently authoritative trustworthy source of information as to who was going to win an election were surveys that had been done at several previous presidential elections by the Literary Digest magazine, and essentially it asked its readers to write in to say who you're going to vote for in this election. It published the figures, and several elections in a row, it got it right. And then Gallup came along in 1936 with his modern scientific polling, with random sampling rather than self-selected surveys. Gallup said that the Democrats would win in a landslide. The Literary Digest said the Republicans would win quite comfortably. Gallup turned out to be right, Literary Digest was wrong, and the reputation of modern scientific polling was made. That's the, that's the Gallup uh, version of, of events. And then there are several layers of complication below that. One layer is that actually it wasn't only Gallup, there were two other modern scientific pollsters in 36, Crosley and Roper, who tend to get a bit overlooked. And in fact, Gallup was not the most accurate of the three, but he was definitely the best self-publicist. So yeah. that's then the second sort of layer of complication is if you look at Gallup's polls in 36, they weren't particularly accurate. He put uh, FDR, he put Roosevelt on getting 54% uh, of the vote and Roosevelt actually got 61% of the vote. So his poll was 7% out. That's most presidential elections that would be considered really quite bad. So he was really lucky that his, you know, the comparator was with the Literary Digest, which was way out the other way. Third level of complication below that is one of the ways that Gallup, with very cheeky and successful sense of self-publicity, grabbed the headlines in 1936, was he, you know, he said, I'm right, the Literary Digest is wrong. And he also predicted in advance of the Literary Digest survey results coming out, how wrong he thought the Literary Digest would be. And he turned out to be right. But you then look at the fieldwork dates of when Gallup did his, his polling and when the Literary Digest did theirs. And even if Gallup had been able to completely accurately predict the level of error, relative error in the Literary Digest, he only was able to predict their overall error correctly out of sheer luck because his fieldwork was different dates from theirs. And so he was lucky that underlying public opinion didn't shift because if it had shifted, his field work, different dates, the level of adjustment he would have then applied to his figures would have still, you know, wouldn't have hit the Literary Digest figures. So there's multiple levels where you dig into it. You think, well, this is, yeah, OK, he's a really good self-publicist. But, you know, but but because he was fundamentally on the right side of history about the, the random sampling being a much better approach than self-selecting, he gets an unreasonably generous write-up <laughs> in many ways. But then also, and this is the bit that really fascinates me as to why it still seems to be mostly overlooked or forgotten in sort of, you know, US, US political and polling history, is there's a, there's a horrible story of sexism and racism at the heart of Gallup's polling methodology. Um, so to give the most generous sort of version of, 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 of this first is that 
one of the things all pollsters do is they sometimes blur a little bit the difference between polling the population or polling the adults, polling the country, and polling voters. And so this is why, you know, in US political polling parlance, you get this difference between registered and likely voters. But even registered voters are not the whole population. And so because in political polling, because in the end, the election result is the thing that you can compare your figures with, what po political pollsters tend to do is they try to poll who is going to like, you know, and they try to have figures that match who's going to vote on the next polling day. And what that means is, therefore, you essentially adjust out of your figures those people who are non-voters. And so you need to be careful not to slip from talking about this is my voting prediction to saying I'm really polling the whole population. Most of the time, though, the differences between that don't really matter and being a bit sloppy in your language doesn't really matter. However, what Gallup did with his polling was he deliberately underweighted women and he deliberately underweighted black Americans. And you could sort of maybe justify that if you're purely doing a election prediction, because sadly, obviously at the time, particularly, uh, one could argue to an extent still now, obviously, but particularly in the 1930s, there was a lot of intimidation and rule bending in especially the South to try and stop black Americans exercising their democratic right. So if you're trying to predict the election outcome, sort of weighting your figures to downplay the number of black Americans sort of made sense. You know, one could justify it in a in a predictive basis, at least. And likewise, after, you know, the franchise was extended uh, broadly to women in the US, initially turnout amongst women was a lot lower than amongst men. So again, downweighting women sort of made sense. But, 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 but the reason this is sort of the dark history of polling that has tended to get airbrushed out is if you look at, say, the newspaper columns that Gallup wrote, he talked about how his polls were reflecting the voice of America. You don't find the caveats about, oh, actually, this is the voice of white men because that's who's more likely to vote. Yeah. One could argue about the ethics of downplaying both women and black Americans in the way that he did anyway, because actually, as female turnout rose, Gallup's methodology didn't catch up with that. And there is a question mark about to what extent, because Gallup was selling his, his polls to be published in newspapers, uh, uh, including in the South, predominantly run by uh, by whites who wouldn't have wanted, you know, a story about uh, Black American political voices necessarily. So there's, some, but even if you leave all of that aside and sort of give him, you know, every break that you can imagine on the underlying motivations and reasoning, you now look back at what he wrote or he, the book, you know, famous book that he wrote about how his polls are run. It's not got a chapter of caveats about, well, this is the real problem of I have to downweight black Americans because they're, you know, bullied out of voting. But of course, that means my overall figures don't represent it. Instead, he just talks about how his polls are the voice of America when when they weren't. And I was just quite, you know, particularly as an outsider, you know, as you know, people watching will be able to tell I'm in many respects, not a black American or a female American. And yet I just really surprised that that, you know, what should be the big embarrassment about the birth of modern scientific polling has generally been missing from history. So I hope in my own little way, I've helped put that record right a bit. And also, therefore, it helps remind people that this difference between voters and the population, that does sometimes matter. There is sometimes a really significant difference between those two. Yeah, I think you know, with George Gallup, and, and and how influential he is, you know, and you're trying to think of, usually you think of polling outfits these mm. days, not necessarily, and there are some exceptions to this, uh, the, the, the characters or, or the individuals behind the polls themselves. One exception to that is, is somebody who, anybody who follows presidential politics, especially presidential primary politics, um, their poll is, is seen as an embodiment of themselves is Ann Selzer from, oh, yeah. from, from Iowa. And, and you're talking about scientific polling. I, I, I don't, I, I, I sometimes think of the Selzer poll as more art than science. Mm -hmm. um, to tell us, because you include uh, Ann yeah. and, and her polling in the book, um, just a little bit about the Selzer poll and, and, and how she approaches polling vis-a-vis -vis some of her, her other competitors. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. I, she her record is amazing, 
because essentially, you know, if you look around the globe, in fact, at pollsters who have, say, had a, had a poll in a particular election that's been very different from all of their rivals, and they've then, they've turned out to be the right, and their rivals have been wrong, and so they're the hero of the hour. Basically, everyone else who falls into that category, then at future elections, either they're back in the pack with everyone else, or if they're an outlier again, they turn out to be the outlier the wrong way. So almost always that sort of crown of being the golden boy or go golden girl pollster, at best you hold it through one election cycle. And Seltzer is, I think, unique globally and in the history of polling of, of actually having been held that crown through multiple cycles, of having been the outlier more than once and consistently been right. She's had some misses as well on occasion, so she's not got a perfect record, but really really impressive the other thing that's really intriguing about her polling is that at the heart of it her methodology is very simple and indeed I think if you were to give say a class of students her methodology and other people's methodology and not tell them though whose methodology was whose a lot of people of us would look at Anne Selzer's methodology and think it's just a bit too simplistic because she really relies on asking people, are you likely to vote in the election and taking their answer at face value? And yet we have a whole load of other evidence and data that people are not very good at predicting how likely they are to vote at an election. And they're more likely, partly out of maybe reasons of social pressure, to feel that they should say yes, even when not. So you look at her methodology and you think, surely you could refine this to take into account some of these other factors and therefore make, and that's obviously what, most other pollsters do and yet there is a there is a certain value in that simplicity of her methodology which time and again has turned up trumps I think one of the unknowns is is her polling to what extent is the superiority of her polling about her versus about Iowa politics so you know she does do polling outside Iowa and so on but you know her reputation making when she stood out from the others and been right, are all about, you know, polls in Iowa, whether for Iowa elections or for uh, primaries, you know, in Iowa. And, you know, I, I, from what I, what I, you know, what I can tell of the sort of state of the field of the research on this, I think that's a bit of an open question, you know, is to what extent is it that she's, she happens to be in a state where that methodology works particularly well, but if she had been, you know, born at the other end of the country and happened to be, say, a, Florida pollster or a New Mexico pollster, maybe that methodology would not be would not be stand out. But the, finally, just the other thing I love about her skill and expertise as a pollster is she is the absolute opposite of the self confident, self aggrandizing sort of ego to testosterone fueled pundit that the media loves and cable TV loves. You know, she is. She is the absolute opposite. And she's a lovely reminder, therefore, that modesty and deprecation and self-doubt often leads to better, smarter outcomes. Well, in, in, or at least uh, in terms of the misses, uh, less egg on, on the face, mm. or less, you know, the, the smaller mea culpas. But I think you know, thinking back to 2020, uh, when the Cells or Poll of Iowa came out, which would have been late, would have been right, right around Halloween, mm. and it showed Trump up in Iowa, close to eight, nine points. Mm. I think that was a real uh, canary in the coal mine mm. moment for, for a lot of um, the folks on the left, or at least those supporting uh, Vice President, then Vice President Biden, that this race was probably going to be closer nationally than a lot of the polling, uh, other polling outfits, um, the, the gold standards were suggesting. Um, so, the, you know, thinking back to your book and the process, uh, process of writing this book, was it the George Gallup findings? What, what, was, what surprised you going and writing this book that you didn't expect to necessarily find that you learned and, and were excited to share as you were writing this book? Um, well, I guess the thing where I probably have learned most from writing the book in terms of understanding, you know, polling now and in the future is realising how messy the story is 
behind the elections where polling has gone badly wrong. And that actually the, the temptation is to say, well, OK, the polling went wrong in this election. What's the story? What's the explanation? What's the factor? And actually, polling is much more like, say, walking a tightrope. That, you know, if you're walking a tightrope, allegedly, I'm not a tightrope walker myself, but as I understand it, if you're walking a tightrope, the point isn't that you keep perfect balance every step along the way. It's that there are lots of little errors and lots of little slips, that, but they balance out. You know, you lean a little bit too much one way, but you're sort of, the wind blows the other way. And that and that normally it, it's a combat, you know, the way you walk safely across the tightrope is a combination of a bit of an error this way, a bit of an error that way, but that never the errors get too much. And when it all goes wrong is because you've just slightly misstepped and leaned slightly one way. And that's the same moment when there's a gust of wind also in that direction. And that's the same moment when you suddenly get itchy in your nose and need to sleep. And it's the combination of all of those errors all being in the same direction rather than a bit of balancing out that's what then causes you to dramatically fall and actually polling errors tend to be like that that it's not that there's one thing that you know all the pollsters got wrong it's that they're unlucky that their set of circumstances means a whole set of different factors all push their polls off in the same direction rather than counterbalancing each other and so in a way the difference between elections when the pollsters get it right and when they get it wrong is not that the underlying samples are somehow better in one election and worse in another, but it's the way in which they're wrong turned out to matter in one election in a way that it didn't in another. So to give a very simple example, uh, which is relevant to the recent US polling, uh, this question about if you have too many people in your polling sample who are really interested in politics. 20 years ago, that didn't really cause a problem for the partisan outcome of the poll. You know, that your your sample might be too politically interested than average, which would be a problem if you're asking questions about how often do you read politics in, you know, in the newspaper. But if you're asking Democrat, Republican, that didn't produce. From, now we're in a world where it seems like that factor is actually quite important because there is a partisan skew that comes from it. And so so I think that sort of that that different way of viewing how and when polling goes wrong is is perhaps the main practical lesson I've learned from from writing the book. And Joe, I, I want to give you a chance to ask a question, but but I wanted to tell the audience, members of the audience, if you have questions, um, go ahead and submit mm -hmm. them in the chat and, and we'll we'll pass those along um, to Mark. While uh, while folks are getting their questions together, I did want to ask something because, you know, what I loved about the book is that you really kind of trace the golden age and the kind of the birth of, of modern of modern polling, you know, uh, and it's fascinating to hear that. And I really appreciate um, your contributions in terms of having a more, more holistic view on 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 Gallup that, you know, that is really a much more honest account. And I think that's really beneficial for audiences today. Um, but I wanted to, to ask ask you, Mark, if um, what your thoughts were on the proliferation of polling. It's something that Ashton mm. kind of commented on earlier. Mm. You know, we, we went from a period where you had a few dominant pollsters um, and, and firms, and now you have, you know, most, you know, most major universities have some form of polling units, even if they're only looking at, uh, at things in, the, in, the, in a particular state in the United States. Um, but you have an increasing number of outfits. And, you know, we talked about the 538, the 530 actually grades all the different pollsters mm. and kind of assigns a letter grade to them. Um, and I'm just wondering if, what your perspective is on this kind of proliferation, the increased number of, of, polling outfits that may well have, you know, shall we say different strengths and different weaknesses that audiences may not be, uh, may not be aware of. Yeah, I think um, there've been a couple of recent sort of studies looking at the accuracy of polling in the US and in the UK and sort of internationally. And there is a pattern that uh, polls in the US do seem to be political polls, do seem to be more inaccurate than they are in the UK. And I think there's an interesting question, therefore, about what's the reason for that. And one possibility is that polling in the US maybe is just harder than in the UK. 
Although that seems, and you know, because after all, the US is in many ways, you know, looking at it from a UK perspective, like multiple countries all in one. Yes. So, you know, maybe that variation, for example, makes polling harder. Although, on the other hand, the more polarized nature of US politics perhaps should make, po and the more sort of ossified, you know, two party system maybe should make polling easier in the US. So, that's maybe there's some mileage in that, but maybe not. Another possibility is just that British pollsters are better than US pollsters. But actually, quite a lot of British pollsters, you know, there's a lot of transatlantic travel amongst pollsters. So that seems unlikely as well. So I think the most likely explanation, and this comes to your question, Joe, is that the larger number of pollsters in the US means there's a larger number of low quality pollsters. And that, in a sense, drags down the average that, you know, the very best are as good and actually in Anselsa's case, probably better. <laughs> than British pollsters don't tell British pollsters I said that um but <laughs> but the, the proliferation and that's because it's really easy to do a poll badly you know it's really easy to say okay we've so you know we've we we've you know bought some data from an online panel we've had a random selection of people from the panel we've waited you know for age and education and gender some of the obvious and therefore we've done a poll and actually really good polling is so much harder than that and so I I I worry a bit that the proliferation reduces standards, but the flip side is there's no one magical correct way of doing polling that is correct for all time. So variation is good in that it, it, it gives you more possible insights. It keeps everyone on their toes. And I guess Trafalgar Group in the US are a really good example of this at the moment, where I think, again, if you were to do that sort of blind methodology assessment, like I sort of mentioned with Anne Seltzer earlier, you'd look at Trafalgar and say, there's quite a lot of question marks about this. But to their absolute credit, you look at their results in the last few years of US elections, they're pretty, pretty good. And so 538, for example, has had, you know, an interesting dynamic of quite often writing quite acerbic stuff about Trafalgar, but also giving Trafalgar one of their highest ratings in terms of quality of, of, of polling. And I think in the, overall, it's healthy if you've got the likes of Trafalgar in the mix, because it makes you, if, if you view polls sensibly, obviously, it makes you think, it makes you have to question more about, well, what's reliable, what's not, what do I really think of as good or what's not? Because as I said, you know, I look at some of the Trafalgar methodology and think, really? But actually, that's that when when they can point to their good results, you think actually that's quite good that it's making us having to second guess a bit more. What do we really think counts as good and reputable methodology? Thank you. So you mentioned um, you know the transatlantic um, nature mm -hmm. of polling. Um, and I remember seeing in 2020, there were a number of UK poll pollster outfits that that had tried to to poll, um, not just you know, not just the national polling, but also state level polling, mm. Florida, uh, North Carolina, I, I believe Redfield Wilton was one yeah. of the cardinal polling. And I their their uh, <laughs> their results were not too good, mm. as I as I recall. Um, but it gets. It, I wanted to get back to the point about sort of the the, the partisan lean of mm -hmm. of some of these polls, and and one one of them, like Rasmussen, Tra mm -hmm. Trafalgar, Insider Advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, the the latter two of those are, are based here in, in the state of Georgia in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area. Um, and then on the left, you know, public policy po polling, Center Street. Is there a similar phenomenon to that? In the UK, where YouGov, I believe, was was founded by, I don't know how many chancellors ago we're on now, but but one of the former chancellors yeah. uh, in the Conservative Party, is there that same phenomenon, and, and is it seen or viewed the same way as it is in the United States, where where somebody on the left might look askance at a, a Trafalgar poll, somebody on the right look might look askance at a PPP poll. There isn't really, uh, with a couple of exceptions, but broadly speaking, I think the, there's an underlying difference of business model that in the UK, a, basically everyone who is doing political polling, it's only a very small part of their business. And so if for no other reason, it would be commercially really unwise to have low quality, deliberate uh, low quality or politically skewed political polling, 
because it's essentially the marketing for all of your other services that you're trying to sell. And therefore, you really want your political polling to be as accurate as possible, because otherwise, you're undermining the overall reputation of the polling firm. So I think that difference of the proportion of the turnover that a political polling that a polling firm has dedicated to political polling in the UK is very small. And I think that's quite different from the US where you've got polling outfits that are much more focused on political polling. Um, there is currently one, in fact, the newest, well, actually, no, second newest. There have been so many new polling firms entering the field recently with political polling in the UK. Second newest in the UK is people polling, who are, the people behind it are somewhat controversial, seen as being on the populist right of politics uh, in general. Uh, but ironically, you know, they've they've had polls coming out for a few weeks now. Their figures are actually much less favourable to the Conservatives uh, than, than other pollsters, noticeably less favourable to the Conservatives. So, you know, I, I view them as, you know, in that sense, a welcome addition to the mix, because it's both, if there is a partisan lean, it's a counterintuitive partisan lean. And I think they're more likely to turn out to be inaccurate, but it's it's healthy to have that reminder that maybe, you know, maybe the, the, the bulk of the of pollsters are getting it a bit wrong and maybe people polling have got something right. And in a way, people polling are a little bit Aunt Seltzer-like in that they do less weighting and adjustment. Um, so at the moment, it looks surprising how little adjustment they make compared to other pollsters in the UK, and that probably makes their figures less accurate. But as Aunt Seltzer reminds us, sometimes that approach actually is better so I'm genuinely intrigued to see come a general election where they end up in the league table of pollsters, because I think that's quite an open question. And it might be like with Trafalgar, they end up with results that are much better than you might expect from purely dissecting their methodology. Mark, can I ask you a question about, about the evolution of polls? This is kind of forward looking and I'm, I'm curious to get your to get your thoughts on it. Um, you know, I, as as you know, Ash and I are both at a, at, a, at an American university here and we work a lot with with undergraduate and graduate students. And so we pick up on generational changes. And so, you know, you think back to kind of the gold standard and traditional polls, you know, of someone, you know, getting a landline phone call and, and actually responding to a series of questions. And obviously the more questions, you know, the quantitative survey is going to give you better, better insights. I, I, and we've seen a lot of changes in terms of how the public uses technology, moving from landline to wire to, to wireless, um, increasingly using text and online resources as well. Um, the first part of my question is: is you know how well do you think the um, the polling industry is is acclimating to technological shifts? Number one, and number two, um, what are your thoughts about? Generation Z and and mm -hmm. and younger people that, in my estimation, at least right now, seem to have uh, a, a much lower likelihood of participating in the kind of mm -hmm. long form surveys that have informed so much of of the good research we've gotten over the years. I think. I mean, overall, I think political polling has been remarkably successful at adjusting to sort of technol technological and demographic change. If you look at the long term history of average errors in election polls. If anything, there's a slight downward trend in recent in recent decades. And um, so despite all of these challenges, you know, first the move from face to face to phone and you know, the rise and fall of landline uh, polling and then the switch to online polling, despite all of these challenges through it all, polling has weathered those changes really, really well. So in that sense, I'm quite optimistic for the future of political polling. I think, you know, telephone polling is sort of dying out and will, you know, I'm, I'm sure will continue to further decline. But that migration to polling being predominantly an online activity seems to have been managed quite successfully. You know, the online pollsters can get good, you know, good results in all sorts of different countries. What I suspect we will see a bit more the rise of, therefore, is what we have a little bit in the UK is the occasional really big budget face-to-face -face survey which tries really hard to get hold of people so you know you pick a random sample and then if you can't get hold of the person in your sample you try them again and again and again and again so you really try to keep to the period and that acts as a really helpful benchmark so we have for example the british social attitude survey which comes out uh, every year in britain 
which has some political questions in it. As you can guess from its title, it's broader than simply party politics. But that gives you a really useful sense check on some questions against, well, what are the internet pollsters doing? Have they actually really diverged massively? And so I do wonder whether in the US we will see uh, universities who have got that ability to think a bit longer term, not having to necessarily chase the next day's news headlines with really swift turnaround polling, but also, you know, using that surveying to get a broader sense of of social data that all sorts of other researchers can use as well as political scientists. I do wonder whether we might see a bit more of a rise of a return to, you know, face-to-face -face polling as being the slow, expensive, but gold standard that you need to be the safety check against the, the, the quicker, cheaper online polling. You know, one thing we haven't talked about yet and something that plays such a, a an outsized role on election nights in the UK versus the United States is exit polling. Mm. Uh, in the UK, yeah, Big Ben tolls, yeah. the, the newscaster throws up mm. the, the exit poll. Yeah. Uh, the Conservative Party will be in government or the largest party, uh, Labour Party landslide, thinking back to 1997. Um, how, how does exit polling work in the, in the UK? And it's seen historically as very, very accurate. I guess an exception would be 1992, perhaps, yeah. um, in terms of the exit polls. And here in the United States, 2004, mm -hmm. which when those those early exit polls came out on CNN and some of the other uh, networks, John Kerry would look like he was he was he was going to run away with the presidency. And obviously, uh, the conservatives won in 1992, which wasn't expected. George W. Bush won a, a close reelection in 2004. How has exit polling changed or or evolved over time and has it has it evolved in similar ways as as predictive polling or polling intention intentional yeah intention. i think i mean exit polling in the us and the uk is really quite a different beast once you scratch under the surface so in the uk exit polls since that uh sort of uh the, the sort of that debacle a few general elections ago have had a really good run and indeed, in two relatively recent general elections, the exit poll has said something that lots of people have thought, surely that's going to be wrong. And it's turned out to be right. Yeah, so, so the exit polling in the UK is on a really good run. And um, exit polling in the UK is purely based on the idea of you poll people during the day in order to, as promptly as possible, when the polls close, to be immediately able to say, this is our really confident prediction as to what the result will be. U.S. exit polling has a, a different history because in the U.S., um, the way you get votes counted in individual precincts and then the precinct result announced before you have the, the equivalent of the constituency-wide result gives you a flow of data coming in of partial results from different places, which you don't get in the U.K. You get no official figures in terms of votes cast in the constituency for different candidates until you've got the final official figure. So you go from zero data to complete data. And so, but in the US, because you have that flow of interim numbers coming in, exit polling involved as a way of supplementing that flow of existing data and has had a much more, yeah, a much patchier, a much patchier record. I think also um, because of that, US exit polling has fallen into a slightly different niche that in the UK, we think of exit polling as the thing that tells you at 10 p.m. who's won. Find out who's won, you can go to bed because, it, you know, the exit polling is pretty, pretty spot on. In the US, I think exit polling is used much more as a way of understanding why things are happening. So this is about how there are differences in, you know, how men and women are voting or between the South and the Midwest or whatever. And so, so, so they're not really, although they've got the same name, they're not really, I think, comparable. And for reasons, frankly, I don't quite understand, you know, there's just not been that investment of, of time and money in making US exit polling into something that could also give you the result. You know, there's no inherent reason why US exit polls couldn't be as good at being able to say, right, polls are closed. There'll be a bit of an argument about when you count polls as having closed given the time zones, but you know, you could say, okay, polls have closed. Here's our exit poll, here's the result. That's not that much more methodologically difficult in the US than in the UK, but that's just not what exit pollers you know, polling has has evolved to do. 
And I wonder how much, and, and Joe sort of touched on this in his, his previous questions about how much polling has sort of driven the political news narrative um, in the United States, as, as opposed to, to, to maybe the UK, whereas you, you'll turn on cable news in the US and especially 24 hour news. Um, and the subject will be the latest New York Times Siena poll or, or the, the, the Washington Post poll or Fox News has a new poll out. And, and I wonder, yeah, I'm trying to trying to find his tweet, um, but uh, Nate Silver from uh, 538, what he said, here it is. What he said was, especially considering the alternative, campaign coverage 10 plus years ago was generally full of cliches, insider groupthink, and regurgitated conventional wisdom. This is classic Nate Silver, if, if for those who don't yeah. know um, Nate Silver, with little concern for what voters actually believed. Some of those things have probably improved, but I don't know. Also, classic Nate Silver. What's what's your take on 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 the role of polling in these polling aggregation sites, and and how they've um, have they really taken the place of the sort of pundit you know, the pundit class, or or is it just one more thing into the mix? Yeah, I think well, certainly in Britain, there's a bigger problem in a way about how our general elections get covered, which is they get the, the general tone of coverage is the election has been called, the race is on, this is what different people are doing to try to win your support. It's all about the decision is up in the air. We're, we're covering a dramatic story, a dramatic race to be the winner. But if you look at the voting intention polls, almost without fail, the party that's ahead in the polls well before the general election gets called is the one that goes on to win. So it's a bit like if you were watching the medal ceremony at the Olympics and you're watching the three people walking out to the podium and you were narrating that as if this is the race, the three people are on, who's going to get to the gold podium first? When actually, of course, it's been predetermined who's going to get to which podium. And so, that, that, you know, so when it comes to the next British general election, the coverage will all be about the race and how it's on and how, you know, parties are setting out their stalls in front of voters and voters are making up their minds. But actually what happened this week and last week is going to be much more determinative of what happens in the end in that election. And so I think there's a fundamental problem that British election coverage needs should be much more backward looking than it is, because it because that's where, you know, if the party who's ahead almost always ends up winning. Party who's ahead well in advance almost ends up winning. The explanation for them winning lies in the past. And that's not the so so I think there's that broad problem. But within that, I think, you know, polling averages and so on are definitely, you know, it's definitely helpful. It makes it easier to make sense of the overall mix, mix of polls um, and there, than, than there was before. And there's also, I think, something that is fundamentally very democratic. And we saw this in the 2010 general election where we had our first televised national leader debates in an election little bit slower on the uptake of adopting those than in the US. And in the very first one of those, Nick Clegg, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, did it remarkably well. But there was also instant polling that immediately showed that he had done really well. And you could see, therefore, that even sort of right wing tabloid newspapers with a very non Lib Dem friendly editorial agenda, they had to report that the Lib Dems had done really well. Nick Clegg had done really well in that debate because everyone knew that to be true because the polls had shown it to be true. And I think that constraining of the ability of a bias in your editorial outlook by pushing reality more, more on you is really helpful. It, you know, reality does sometimes get rebuffed. Certainly, I've watched some cable news in the US and think reality has been kept well away from it. But, you know, the I, I think there is something fundamentally really powerful that what determined that Daily Mail front page the day after the debate wasn't the political leanings of the owner, wasn't the political preferences of the editor. It was the voice of the public as expressed through opinion polls. And that's a really good thing, because in that sense, opinion polls are like, say, the jury in a courtroom. Not a perfect tool by any means. Lots can and has been, you know, written and studied and worried about how juries can be biased and get things wrong and so on. But fundamentally, there is something really good 
about the idea that everyone on the jury is equal, everyone in the polling sample is equal, doesn't matter who you went to school with, doesn't matter how much money you've got, you're still just the one response in that poll. And that is a leveller, a sort of democratic enabler that is so rare in all the rest of politics. And I think the jury room is the closest that you get to sort of an equivalent of that in, in public life. All the jurors are equal. Everyone in the polling sample is equal, except ironically for the poor teenager from a minority community, because they tend to be so hard to sample that their views actually get upweighted. So even the caveat that I've sort of airbrushed out with the simplicity of what I've said, in a sense, reinforces the point <laughs> that the, the, the middle class professional who is oversampled in so many ways, actually, if anything, has their views downweighted. So I think there is a, a really good democratic principle at the heart of polling. And sadly, that's what George Gallup was so eloquent about. But he converted it into into to thinking that the views of white men, therefore, were particularly <laughs> were 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 an equivalent of the views of all Americans. But actually, a lot of his rhetoric, albeit misapplied, really, I think, hit the mark very well. Well, it, it's interesting to go from Clegg mania to you know the, the theory of courtrooms and juries. To, the, you you got to there's a really important point in there about waiting and and, mm. and up waiting and down waiting and silent Tories and shy Republican voters, shy Trump voters, for example. And, and is it simply the case that pollsters have to just guess? Does it really come down to that about guessing what the electorate on November 8th here in the United States or whenever their general election is in the UK, be it before Christmas or after Christmas? Yeah. Um, is that really what it comes down to? I, I think the more dignified way of saying it is that it's part art, part science, because uh, fundamentally, anyone who's willing to take the time to respond to a political poll, by their very nature of that, is they're a bit different. And so you do, you know, however hard you try, unless you really can spend lots of money on that random door to door call back repeatedly on people's sort of approach. In practice, all of the sampling ends up with biased samples. And the question is, how do you adjust the sample? And you can do that a bit with science. You can do that a bit with precise maths in terms of getting, say, the gender mix or the geographic mix. But you can't all do all of it because, as you say, you know, if you're particularly trying to say this is what the election result would be, you've got to factor in things like turnout and I mean, I can be pretty sure if there's an election next week, I would vote. I could say with absolute confidence to the pollster that I would vote, but I might be suddenly struck down ill. You know, even, you know, so turnout is a really difficult thing in particular to model and to measure correctly, which is one of the reasons why, again, the pattern across polling globally is the lower the turnout in an election, on average, the less accurate the polls tend to be, because that's where you get into the art or the guessing depending on what term one, one wants to use of trying to get your adjustments right well joe do you have any questions about uh about polling unpacked before we sort of move on to the, the to the final stages looking ahead yeah I had, I had I had two questions. Um, one is about you know you know we 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 have in the United States now early voting and kind of it expands the outlook because you know what used to be decided on mm. a single you know polling day or election day is decided across a span of and sometimes weeks and weekends. And uh, I'm wondering how challenging that makes what a what a pollster does. Um, so that that's 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 one of my one of one of my questions. Um, and then I'll I'll let you speak to that and then I'll have one more and then I'll, yeah. I'll be ready to wrap up. Um, I mean, it, it's an intriguing puzzle because, I mean, in Britain, we don't have early voting, but we do have postal voting. And actually, postal voting is is, I think, a much uh, more established part of the norm for a lot of people about how they vote. Yeah, and 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 it's also less partisan controversy about postal voting as well in in the UK. Um, and but in both cases, you know, whether it's early voting or postal voting, you sort of think, well, that should be problematic for pollsters, particularly if you've got a turbulent politics. You've got people voting at all sorts of different times other than polling. It feels like it should make polling problematic. In practice, it doesn't seem to be a problem. It's it's curious that it's not like there's a pattern of, 
you know, as postal voting has gone up in Britain, that polling has got less accurate. So um, in a way, it's a lucky break, I guess, pollsters should yeah. just be grateful for. I think it also reflects that um, both early voting and postal voting, although significant, are, you know, not that large a part of the total number of votes cast. So even if you're off on them by a few points, you then have to you know, fraction that down to what proportion of the total voters is. So there's that factor as well. I think it also reflects that there, there tend not to be that dramatic movements, you know, within a campaign, partly going back to what I was saying earlier, most of the time. So if people have voted early, then they might not be that different. I think also there's perhaps a counterbalancing effect that as it's become more widespread, people who early vote or postal vote have become more like everyone else as it's become a lot a more normal thing to do but yeah fundamentally pollsters have cut a lucky break that what sounds like it could be a problem so far fingers crossed hasn't hasn't really turned into one yeah and i, I think we've also seen a bit of a decline at least in the united states in really really sizable october surprises and i think what the curious test would be is if there is a a big breaking news event or a big revelation that happens, let's say midway through early voting that could really shift things. I don't think we've seen anything that would be an example of that. And that to me would be the real test case to see. But I agree, it seems like it should be a bigger issue than it is, but the reality is it doesn't seem like it like it is. My, my follow-up question is this, and this is more about, about campaign politics and mm -hmm. rhetoric, vis-a-vis -vis polls. Um, in America, we see this a lot with Republican candidates or, or even candidates that are just trailing. Um, there's kind of the old acts that, you know, I don't trust the polls. I don't believe in the polls. The only poll that matters is poll on election day. Um, even if it's, you, even if they're up, I mean, right now in Georgia, you know, we have a, a gubernatorial race and the incumbent governor, um, Governor uh, Brian Kemp is in the most polls up as much as double digits in some polls. And he still says, I don't I don't trust the polls. I'm running like I'm behind. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, there's almost a folks equality about people kind of saying, you know, I don't listen to the polls. That's not what factors into my decision making. But I I've yet to find an intelligent campaign or leader that doesn't consume polling information. Mm, exactly. So I'm curious if that is a phenomenon that you see in the UK as well, this kind of at least public disdain or minim minimization of polling by uh, by elected officials while they really rely on them privately. Yeah, it's I think it's the most common sort of uh, little lie that I think politicians yeah. tell in my experience. They say that they're not bothered by the polls. They don't listen to them. They don't believe them. And they absolutely <laughs> you know, it's, um, but, but I do think, to be fair to politicians, you know, um, is if you're, let's say, behind in the polls, if the polls are looking really bad for you, I mean, what are you going to say? You know, right. There's a bit of if you give an, occasionally politicians give honest answers about when the polling looks bad for them or their party or their side and that almost never goes down well with the media so there's a bit of you can't really say the truth because it'll be a gaff and all of that but also there's a bit of you've just got to motivate yourself i mean for all that i mean there's all sorts of weird and wonderful and strange and unpleasant people have ended up being politicians but fundamentally Politician, most politicians in an election campaign, unless it's a really safe seat or a safe outcome, have to work phenomenally hard. And if you're working phenomenally hard day in, day out, you need to give yourself some sort of hope. You need to give yourself. So I do think there is a degree to which in the best, for the best of possible reasons, politicians do tend towards a little bit of self-delusion because if you can't convince yourself there might be hope, how on earth would you get up and do what you need to do every day? So, you know, I, I always try to remember a little bit of sympathy when you hear a politician saying something really daft about, oh, don't believe the polls, look at the posters that you could see in the front gardens down the road around the corner and that sort of stuff, because let, let people delude themselves a bit if that's what keeps them going, because in the end, reality with the election result will arrive. Thank you. Well, Mark, I, I wanted to, you know, close by 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 asking a couple of questions about the, mm. the looking ahead to the future, and and that's a dangerous business in the mm -hmm. UK, especially in UK politics right now. Um, but one question was about books, and hey, you just finished a project, and, and and as a historian myself, the the thought of uh, moving on to the next project after finishing one is is terrifying mm -hmm. and exhausting. 
Uh, but I was wondering, are, are you are you going to or or plan to in the near future return to your roots, as your, your historian roots, and, and 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 write a historical treatment of of either elections or political parties or something that you, you've you've had your your professional political career in? Well, th there's one. The question about what was the first election at Saw polling in my mm -hmm. book, I give the sort of traditional answer to, and to the best of my knowledge, it's the right answer, but I'm not quite convinced. So I'll, I'll let me explain that mystery to you. So the normal story, which I you know, also follow in my book, is that the first election at, we, at which we saw polling was the 1824 US presidential election. And the polling that we saw at that election were straw polls. So things like people summoned at a muster meeting a militia muster meeting, you'd then do a show of hands or something similar to say, which of the presidential candidates are you going to support? Um, and that does appear to be the first, you know, time that we had that sort of, you know, slightly crude, maybe we should call it surveying rather than polling, but that, you know, that trying to measure public support in some sort of manner at election time. And there are reasons to believe that 1824 was the first such election, partly because that's the first one that we can see in the historical record, partly was because, as you know, uh, viewers who are you know, familiar with US politics will know, 1824 was a really unusual presidential election, and it was one where the previous dominant party's grip was fracturing. In fact, there were several candidates all from the same party running in that election. And individual states had moved more and were moving more and more to having allowing the public or at least um, male non-slaves to vote, to choose who should be their representatives in the Electoral College. So the public's choice had more of an influence on the election as well. So it sort of makes sense that 1824 was a pioneering election. But you look at the global history of elections, 1824 in the US was a relative latecomer, you know, in that sense, in terms of an election where there was a real choice and the public had some say. And also, if you look at the contemporary newspaper accounts of things like the you know, militia muster meetings and the tallies being done at them, the straw polling, they're not the sort of newspaper accounts that at least I would expect if it was really a completely novel idea that had somehow spread around the country really quickly for the very first time. It feels much more like people reporting on something that is a bit more familiar. So I do think there's an interesting question mark about is 1824 really the right starting point for history of polling? And that's, I just, I've not found anything prior to that, but it just does feel a bit unsatisfactory. So I do, you know, I've I've covered myself with my readers by throwing in a footnote in the book about, you know, this is the first known <laughs> example. Um, so that might be quite fun to attempt to return to, to go on a hunt for but for what happened prior to that, maybe it's another country. Uh, maybe it's in some other form in earlier US elections. And um, right. the other thing that I think would be really interesting uh, to sort of you know look at, I think more systematically as well, is what the what the actual impact of polling is on the decision making of politicians. And we've touched on that a bit in this conversation. But I think, particularly say in the US, where you have a system with the way the presidency operates, where there is a very clear paper trail of this is the information that was passed to the president and when and so on. And so there's an ability to look perhaps systematically at what, how much polling information came the president's way or how much polling information came the prime minister's way, what was the polling that their political party was privately commissioned to sort of try and trace how that has changed over, over time. That might be... Um, but both of those require lots of time to do proper archival research. So I fear they may stay daydreams for a long time. Well, and I, I think that gets me to my next question, which is you are planning to, to run for another term as, as party. Indeed, I am in the middle of that contest at the moment. Wait, a contest which, with no polls, sadly. <laughs> which, which, I mean, I'm trying to think of a, 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 a term of a party president um, that is more eventful than the mm. one that you you have have experienced since the 2019 uh, contest or, or in, in 2020 what what's it been like navigating po politics since the 2020 pandemic yeah. 
Well, actually, in a way, I think the most interesting element goes back to the pre when I was first elected. So I was elected in an election in 2019 because, in a you know, in a very minor way, running for president with an all member ballot gives a bit of an insight into what it's like running for public office on bigger scales. And the thing I'm particularly struck by is when I stood for the election in 2019, I was already someone who was quite used to getting up in front of a room full of people or an audience in a hall and talking. I'd done lots of you know, internal speech making, lots of training sessions, taking part in debates at our national conference and so on. So in that sense, I was used to standing up in front of lots of strangers and talking about politics. But there's something very different about doing a hustings, doing a, a debate, you know, with your with your other candidate uh, was up against one other person that time. There's something very different about sort of personally being on the spot. And I think that really gave me an understanding as to why you so often see amongst politicians somebody who looks like they're a really successful politician, but then they run to be leader of the party or they run for their party's nomination to be the presidential candidate. And you think, why are they stumbling? Why are they, you know, why are they so bad at this? Because there is something very different about that, the nature of that sort of uh, experience, which it was, yeah, it was, I, I found it really useful in terms of understanding others to see that at work myself. Um, but I'm also aware that I'm really lucky to have one of the very few sort of roles or posts that lockdown and all of the health you know, restrict, you know, all the problems that came from coronavirus and restrictions on the movement. Very, very lucky to have one of the few roles which was actually made easier because with everyone moving to doing so much on Zoom and on video conferencing, I've been able to do local party calls with, you know, people, colleagues from all around the country over Zoom. And just how I would have coped with the amount of travel that would have been required otherwise in the last three years, I really don't know. So I feel very lucky to have, have had the... And obviously, like everyone, I feel like we're all on Zoom far too much now. But I'm absolutely, I recognise its advantages. As indeed, you know, hopefully this has demonstrated the fact that you can you can bring in a guest from the other side of the world far, far easier than if you'd been thinking about doing this or if I published my book, say, five years ago. Oh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's something that has sort of democratised the, the, the ability to participate, mm. um, you know, with, you know, people, it costs money to travel and it, it, it costs, um, uh, there's a lot of resources that go into that um, environmentally as well, um, that that Zoom has sort of, I shouldn't say just Zoom, Skype, we've always had Skype, Skype's always been with us, but, but, but the proliferation of it during the pandemic um, has sort of opened up opportunities like these. Well, I, I, we're at 1230. Um, Mark, Mr. President, thank you uh, very much uh, on behalf of um, Professor Watson, uh, Grady College here at the University of Georgia, everybody at the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia. Um, really do appreciate taking some time, especially out of what is a chaotic uh, right, schedule pleasure. on your end, I'm sure. And it's probably only, if the odds makers are right, it's only going to get more chaotic. So I, I, I shudder what state I'll find the government's in when I go on Twitter after we end this call. <laughs> I we, we we were we were jo we were joking um, in emails back and forth mm. that, oh, you know, looking forward to our to our our, our webinar on Friday. Uh, maybe we'll be talking about who the new prime minister is. Ha, ha 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 ha. I'm walking <laughs> into did. work. I'm walking into yeah. work yesterday and uh, my you know, Twitter notification goes off. And sure enough. Absolutely. <laughs> been lovely to join you this morning stroke afternoon thank you so much for your time and really good questions thank, thank you, you very much mark much appreciated